Hello, and welcome to Lecture 4 of Periodic Motion in Phys 1104. In this lecture, we're going to look at some specific examples of how to work with the simple harmonic oscillator equation. In the last lecture, we met this simple harmonic oscillator equation, which is a second-order differential equation, and one of the things I said at the time is that, first of all, any system which obeys this equation is a simple harmonic oscillator, so if we can show that a system obeys this equation, then we know it's a simple harmonic oscillator. The other thing we can do with it is we can use this equation to find the angular frequency of the oscillation. Now usually what you actually want is the period or frequency, or perhaps that's what's easy to measure in the lab, but there's an easy relationship between period, frequency, and angular frequency. It may not be clear to you what I mean by showing that a system obeys the simple harmonic oscillator equation. So let's take the simplest example, which we know is a simple harmonic oscillator, which is a mass on a spring. So here's a cart, and as usual I've put the axes at the equilibrium position. And we now know that the equation of motion for this, well, all we care about is the x component, and all we've got is a force obeying Hooke's law. And note the negative. I've needed the negative here because if you think about which way this force points, if the cart is pushed to positive x, the force points back in the negative x direction, and so its x component is negative, whereas if the cart is pushed to negative x, then the x component of this force is positive, and so the, the x component of the force is proportional to the negative of x. And so there is our equation of motion, single force equals ma. And if you just rearrange it, it looks like this. Now, compare it to the simple harmonic oscillator equation. You can see that it is an equation of the same force. Ax is proportional to negative x, and there's this constant out in front. And we can now use that to identify what the angular frequency is, because just compare the two. Clearly, k over m is omega squared, and so we know that the angular frequency is just the square root of the spring stiffness divided by the inertia of the cart. So that's how we use the simple harmonic oscillator equation to determine the angular frequency of a system. Now we would like to relate the angular frequency to the period, because that's the thing that's easier to measure in the lab. So remember that angular frequency is a rate of change of phase, which is the angle that the phaser is making. And so by definition, angular frequency is a change in phase over a change in time. And I don't need to get into derivatives because our phaser is going around at constant speed. And the phase must be in radians, as we've already discussed. Well, one thing you hopefully know about radians is that there are two pi radians in a circle. Think about why that is. An angle in radians is just an arc length divided by the radius. And if you go around a circle, you've gone the full circumference, which is 2 pi radii. And so you must have gone through an angle of 2 pi radians. So there are 2 pi radians in a circle. And the time to go around one cycle is what we define as the period. And so that means that the angular frequency must be the, the number of radians you go through in a full cycle, which is 2 pi, divided by the time for a full cycle, which is the period. And there we have it. We have a relationship between angular frequency and period. And similarly, since the frequency is the 1 over the period, we can see that the angular frequency is related to the frequency just by a factor of 2 pi. So let's do an extended example that brings these ideas together. Here's a cart attached to a spring, and it's initially pulled 5 centimeters to the right from its equilibrium position, and then it's not just released, it's given a quick shove so that it starts off 5 centimeters to the right of an equilibrium and moving at 40 centimeters per second back towards equilibrium. And we're going to write the position as a function of time for the cart. And I've given you its inertia and the spring stiffness. 
And we know that the um, position as a function of time has to take this form, but to fully write it, that means we need to know the amplitude, and we need to know the angular frequency, and we need to know the initial phase. And at the moment we don't know any of those things. Note, the amplitude is not 5 centimeters, because when it is out at a position equal to the amplitude, the cart should be stationary. And it's not stationary when it's 5 centimeters to the right of equilibrium. The easiest thing to find, and so we might as well get it first, is the angular frequency, because we know that the angular frequency has a nice simple relation to the spring constant and the inertia. And note that this means something that we could probably figure out for ourselves. As we make the cart more massive, the angular frequency decreases. If we make the spring stiffer, the angular frequency increases. So in this case, we just get that this is 40. You get about 8.9. And let's check the units. We know it should be radians per second, but radians are sort of a non-unit unit, right? They're really dimensionless. So root newtons per meter over kilograms, that is root kilogram meters per second squared per meter over kilograms and the kilograms are gone, and these meters are gone, and so we get root 1 over seconds squared, and that is indeed 1 over seconds, which we can interpret as a dimensionless thing over seconds. So you can write radians per second, or second to the negative 1, or whatever. We don't actually need the period, but it's nice to get it because it's easier to think about than the angular frequency and just to make sure that this is making some sort of sense. So we know that the angular frequency and period are related to each other this way, and so the period is just 2 pi over omega. And if you plug that into your calculator, you'll see that the period is about 0.7 seconds, which seems like a reasonable period, right? You can picture a period of 0.7 seconds. The next thing that's easy-ish to get is the amplitude, and in fact with methods I've shown you there's no way you can get the initial phase without knowing the amplitude. There is a way, but I haven't shown you how, so let's go and get the amplitude next. What we know is that the amplitude is directly related to the energy, so let's get the energy. We know that the energy is going to be the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. And we know everything there at the initial time, and so we can just plug all those numbers in. So here is the energy, and I used the initial position and speed to get that energy. But note that this is a closed system, and so this energy is constant. So even though both v and x are changing, the energy isn't. Now, we got this because we know that the amplitude is directly related to the energy, and we want to know the amplitude. And you could look back at the previous lecture and see what the relationship is, but I don't want you to memorize equations. I want you to be able to work from equations that are sort of obvious. And this equation is just saying that the energy is the kinetic energy, which you know how to write down, and the potential energy, which is just a spring potential energy, and so you know how to write it down. Well, notice that when the oscillator is at its maximum displacement from equilibrium, then by definition x is a, or technically plus or minus a, but let's work with plus a, and at that moment its speed has to be zero. So we can use that to say that the energy is also equal to, well, at that moment it has to be equal to the same amount, and so the kinetic energy is zero then, and the potential energy is just a half k 
a squared, and there's our direct relationship between a and e. And if you look back, this is slightly different from the one I got in the previous lecture, because this one is specific to a mass on a spring because it's involving the spring stiffness. So we can now solve for a. Just solve that. And so we see that the amplitude is 6.7 times 10 to the negative 2, or about 6.7 centimeters. The final thing we need to know is the initial phase. And this is the part that gives students the most trouble. And the reason it gives them trouble is quite simple. It's that it involves doing an inverse trig function. And most students are pretty shaky on inverse trig functions. So let's see how you do this. At t equals 0, t just goes away in there, and so we have that the initial position is x sine of the initial phase. And since we know x at t equals 0, it's 5 centimeters, and we now know the amplitude, this is an equation where the only unknown is phi i. And so we can solve for phi i. So there we have it. We can now just plug in numbers and get an answer, except that we have to be careful because inverse trig functions are tricky and they always have an infinite number of answers, even though your calculator will always just give you one answer. So I think when you do an inverse trig, you should always have a curve drawn that is the function that you're inverting. Because notice, what we're going to do is we're going to solve for phi i by saying that xi is 5 centimeters and a is 6.7 centimeters. So that's going to give us something like, I don't know, about 0.8. Well, the sign goes between 1 and negative 1. So fundamentally what we're asking is where does the sine function cross this line? And notice it crosses it here and here and here and in fact an infinite number of other places. And we just want one of them. Your calculator will give you this one. And that's not necessarily the one we want. So let's first actually do it and see what the calculator says, and then we'll figure out what the actual answer is. So my calculator has informed me that this inverse sign gives me 0.84 radians. Now notice, pi over 2 is about 1.5. So as I predicted, my calculator has indeed given me this answer. Is this the answer we wanted? Well, look, this cart is starting at a positive position. All right, so far, so good. We've got an initial phase that is giving us a positive position. However, it's initially moving left. In other words, x is initially decreasing. And so this is not the solution we want. The solution we want is this one over here. Well, what the inverse sine function has just given us is this distance on the graph. This is 0.84 radians here. But the sine function is symmetric about here, and so that means the solution we want is the same distance from pi. In other words, this is 0.84 radians here. And so the actual initial phase that we want is just pi minus 0.84 radians, which turns out to be about 2.3 radians. So we can now collect this all together and write our position as a function of time. There's the amplitude, and it's multiplied by a sine of, and our angular frequency was 8.9 inverse seconds times t, right? This has to be a function of time, and all plus our initial phase.